Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Tasmania. I'm Diane, and I'm the sales executive from Coral Expeditions. Um, we'll be taking you through a journey um, of Tasmania today, and we've got a couple of different itineraries to talk through today. So we've got our coastal wilds and our coastal tracks of Tasmania. Um, we will be traveling there on this beautiful ship on Coral Discoverer. She's only got 36 cabins and can take a maximum of 72 guests. So really nice, small numbers, true expedition style, um, really intimate and relaxed atmosphere. Um, and of course, she's got that shallow draft, so it can get us um, into all those very remote locations um, that the larger ships can't get us into. Um, so we will be, um, today who will be joining us is um, Ian Terry. So we're very lucky to have um, Ian Terry with us today. He is a guest lecturer um, and has been living in Tasmania since uh, 1984. Um, so definitely knows Tasmania very, very well. Um, it has worked in cultural heritage management, um, a freelance historian and a senior curator of history at the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery. Ian, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Diane. It's great to be here. Um, now, tell us a little bit about yourself, Ian, um, and what you're passionate about and uh, what your role is within Coral Expeditions. Okay, well, I'm passionate about Tasmania, really. I mean, I, I more or less grew up in Sydney and came here in my mid-20s, 38 years ago. And what drew me here was the history. I had a degree in history, um, but also the wilderness, the outdoors. Um, I wanted to spend my time bushwalking, really. And so Tasmania, I think, is, is well, for me, being Tasmanian now, is the most spectacular part of Australia, um, scenically and, and historically, because it's a very small state that hasn't been done well economically over 200 years. We've actually kept a lot of our old history in the state. And as a historian, um, that's fantastic. We've got Aboriginal history, we've got colonial history, we've got really important history around environmental activism. Um, so it's got everything. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. I mean, so it is um, It is certainly a place of diversity for our guests to go if, um, you know, to there to learn about all those things that you've just spoken about. Um, you know, such a great place to, to capture all of that, uh, the history and geology and, um, and wildlife, really. Well, the wildlife here is fantastic. You know, we've got <clears throat> a lot of species here which were once abundant on the mainland, which are either extinct on the mainland or virtually extinct on the mainland. And they're still in quite good numbers in Tasmania. So it's, again, one of the joys. You, can, you can't drive around the state in the summer without seeing a kidna on the road, for example. Now, how often do you get a, that you know, in the rest of Australia. It's just absolutely wonderful here. Yeah, no, that's um, that's lovely. And I'm sure our guests would appreciate that as well. And sort of every turn, there's there's something spectacular to see along the way. Indeed, yes. Um, now, so this is the coastal wilds. Um, so Ian will take us um, a little bit more in depth um, as to each place that we go to um, for the coastal wilds. Um, we do have the coastal tracks, which is, which is quite different um, because it is more challenging in terms of the hikes. Um, so we do just say with the coastal tracks, um, it is for, for very fit people um, who really are intrepid hikers. Um, coastal wilds does have quite a bit of walking as well um, and not as challenging, um, but just to differentiate between the two, we will take you through that through this webinar as well. So um, it's a 10 night trip Hobart to Hobart. Um, and we'll be traveling in uh, January and February of next year, usually between January and March is when we have our Tasmania season. Um, so I guess you've really, you've really already covered, um, you know, all the beautiful things that we can do. Um, so let's maybe dive straight into it. Um, I think I will first up say that, you know, Tasmania is, our, our trips are very dependent on the weather. So, um, Obviously, we do only plan when we get to Hobart to see um, how the trip's going to plan out. Um, so, you know, just, just so that everybody is aware, it's not that we have day one, two, three, four, five, this is what we're going to be doing. It is heavily dependent on the weather. So um, we depart uh, Hobart and um, head off through the, the Bathurst Channel and uh, make our way to Port Davey. Um, Port Davies is the southwest of Tasmania and really a true expedition style location. Um, 
mainly inaccessible by land um, unless you're wanting to hike there um, which I believe takes a few days to get there so um, what is special about this place um, Ian what why do people just want to come here well Diane as you say it is very remote I mean we're down in the very southwestern corner of the state um, that bottom southwestern third or even more than a third is basically without roads um, there's a little airstrip near Port Davey that people fly into. Uh, you can walk. It's about a four to five to six day walk, depending on which way you go, um, across muddy button grass plains, <laughs> <laughs> one of the routes, or across you know coastal mountain ranges, the other. Spectacular walks, but you know it is. It's a difficult place to get to. So to be able to get in there by ship is amazing. It was, it's got a really rich Aboriginal history. Um, Aboriginal people were living here in this area for 40, 50, 60,000 years. We don't know exactly how long, but certainly, you know, something of that order. Uh, we don't really see much in the way of Aboriginal history on the, on, on this um, trek. Oh, in, in Port Davey, apart from a walk that was put together by Parks and the Aboriginal community, about 10 years ago at Melaleuca. And that's about a or 20 minute, half hour boardwalk um, where the community have put together a few interpretive panels and re reconstructed aspects of Tasmanian Aboriginal um, culture that we, the visitors, guests can have a look at as we go by. But really the whole, the whole area, look, in European history, People have tried several times, back, particularly in the 19th century, they thought oh, there's this big wide empty space, we'll be able to grow sheep there, or we'll be able to grow crops there, or you know, we'll be able to use it, we'll be able to exploit it. But it just wasn't possible, the soils aren't good enough for that sort of thing. There was a whaling industry here, there was a timber getting industry here, and there's been small scale mining industries here. But apart from that, it is really, really remote. And none of those industries have taken place for at least 30 years. Yeah, wow. Um, so, um, you know, a true coral expeditions uh, location remote, um, you know, it's a, a wonderful place and beautiful scenic views that you can see. Well, from it's, the all, it's all World Heritage Area, of course. Yep. It's been part of the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area since the mid 1980s after the Franklin Dam dispute. Um, so there's not gonna be any more development in the area. I mean, you can see from this photograph, the mountains around these waterways and it looks beautifully still there at the moment and you get spectacular still weather with, with uh, amazing reflections in, in Port Davey, which is what we have here um, and in Bathurst Harbour. Um, of course you get wild weather. Of course. <laughs> incredibly wild weather. And as you were saying early on, the itineraries for Tasmania, guests have to understand that, that um, they're not an itinerary where we go from A to B to C to D in a set order. The captains know what the weather is. They, they're keeping an eye on what the forecasts are and they will zip round to Port Davey. It only takes a few hours to get round there when the weather is right. And sometimes you have to pull out fairly quickly as well. I remember a couple of years ago, my first trip there, we were climbing up one of the mountains and then we suddenly got the radio call. Fronts, ch you know, change is coming, a front's coming through, get back to the boat and we're out of wow. here. And so wow. we had an exciting, on the, on the Explorer, we had this most exciting trip back from the base of Mount Beatty. I'm sure, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Bit of a bumpy ride. It was a bumpy ride, but yeah. everyone just loved it, of course, you know. <laughs> it's, no, sort of, it's, it's the sort of weather, I mean, as a Tasmanian, I love it. You know, I love it. it it's mm -hmm. this part of, part of what we love about this state. It's this changeable weather. You get these amazing storms and, and it's just spectacular. Yeah, brilliant. Um, you know, we, in Port Davey, we do, you know, just the beautiful um, place that it is. We do spend a couple of days there um, and head into uh, Melaleuca. Um, yes, you know, you middle. Can see our little explorer tender goes right into the the channel there, um, getting us really close into the action. Yes, yeah, so Milaluka is one of these places which there was a small tin mine there from about the 1930s up to early 1990s, and it was operated by a legendary figure called Denny King, 
um, who lived there in that time and, and really ran a subsistence mine on the site there. Um, the airstrip you can see in the distance there, that little bit of, bit of uh, yellow, yellow land, he actually built that back in the 1950s and 1960s to provide further access and access for bushwalkers and the like. And the people here, they're on the, the, the Meadwani walk, the Aboriginal little interpretive walk around, around the site there. You can also see there the orange-bellied parrot on the right-hand side. Um, so the orange-bellied parrot is one of, if not Australia's rarest bird. Um, it's a very small parrot, a little bit bigger than a budgerigar, and it, it breeds in Tasmania, in the southwest of Tasmania, in the, in the summertime, and then it heads up in the winter or in the autumn, it flies up the coast of Tasmania across Bass Strait to Port Phillip Bay and places west of there for feeding. Now, because of habitat destruction, there's only about 30 or 40 or 50 of these birds left in the wild. And Denny King was instrumental in trying to save this bird and to getting research projects up about the bird, um, feeding the birds that came to you know, give them something to, to, to eat. Uh, and we can go there, there's a, there's a little bird hide there, which he built with the help of the Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, and this bird hide, every, every summer, volunteers come down to go into the bird hide and to, they put feed out for the birds so that the, the birds that are there come and feed these feeders about 10 metres away. You can look at them through binoculars um, and, and just see these most amazing birds. Of course, we have to remember also there they are wildlife. Yeah, of course. So, you know, we don't always see them. <laughs> Yeah, of course, absolutely. I mean, it is a treat if we do see them, uh, yeah. but you know, um, I'm sure any any bird lovers uh, would would be in their element if they did see these orange-bellied parrots. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, the little bird hide there's also been made into a little museum about Melaleuca and Denny King as well, and that's really interesting for guests to see oh, as well. Oh, fantastic! Wonderful. Now, if we do, again, if the weather is playing ball with us, um, we do get to do a bit of uh, kayaking as well and um, a walk, a Mount Milner walk as well. Um, now, the weather looks exceptional here, of course, uh, blue skies and bright sunshine, but um, we know Jan through March is, um, is quite temperamental. And um, what sort of temperature would I guess be looking at this time of year? Oh, look, you can get everything from 11 degrees to 35 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a, a day like this, um, this is probably 20, 25 degrees. It's probably a bit cool. Where there's a bit of a breeze there by the look of the sea. So there's a little bit of a breeze that cools it off a bit. It's actually perfect weather for, for climbing up Mount Milner, for example, walking down to Spain Bay, if that becomes an option. Um, Bramble Cove here, which is just inside Port Davy. It's um, the most beautiful place. It looks absolutely, <clears throat> excuse me, absolutely pristine there. But back in the 19th century, there were five whaling stations, would you believe, wow. dotted around that bay that you can see there, five wow. whaling stations. Wow. There's still a couple of <clears throat> graves that are there. We don't get to see those. They're a bit out of the way. But I think it's really interesting. We go to these beautiful places, wild places, but the human history back in the day is quite strong and rich. So a lot, lots for our guests to learn then about the history. I think, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm an avid, avid hiker, so this would appeal to me because of the hiking aspect. But, you know, when you learn about all the, the history and what used to go on, it's, it's really fascinating and educational. And the thing about Mount Milner is you, you, you love your walking. Mount Milner is a climb, it's quite a steep climb, it's not too far, not too long, most people can, can do it, um, but you just get the most amazing views, you get the uh, views up the north up the coast, of the <clears throat> northern part of Port Davey, south down towards Southwest Cape, east into Port Davey and Bathurst Harbour, um, and then sort of northeast into the mountain areas, uh, it's just exquisite, out to the Breaksea Islands, which are this group of islands, which really shelter Port Davy. So, you know, Port Davy is cops the, or the, the west coast there cops the, the roaring 40s, these yeah. huge winds yeah. and seas that come in. The break sea islands, which go right across the entrance to Port Davy, essentially break 
form a shelter for Port Davey to you know, stop those waves coming in. So you get a fantastic view of the Breaksy Islands from up on Mount Milner as well. And you see the, you know, in summertime, there's beautiful wildflowers out there, little trigger plants. If you're lucky, there's Christmas bells or, or um, Tasmanian, uh, Tasmanian iris. There's just, you know, various tea trees. But it's, a, it's a lovely place. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and our next uh, stop is um, Bruni Island Adventure Bay. Again, um, you know, a few few walks that we can do here as well. Some a little bit more challenging than others. There's some beach walking, um, Grassy Point Bay. Um, I believe we go, you know, past some, there's a bit of maritime history there with the whaling station as well. Yes, yeah, so all these photos here are taken around Adventure Bay and around um, the Fluted Cape Walk and Grass Point Walk. So Grass Point is on is actually on the Fluted Cape Walk. So some people just want to go along the coast to this uh, to Grass Point, which were the remnants of a whaling station which operated from the mid 1820s right through to about the 1830s, 1840s. Um, Whaling was a big industry in, in Tasmania in the early 19th century. It actually underpinned the economy early on. Wow. The middle photo there, you've got Adventure Bay. Now, Adventure Bay is fascinating because it, it was actually one of the first places that Europeans landed in Tasmania. And it was spotted by Abel Tasman in 1642. But the first person to land there was in Cook's Voyage in 1773. And they suddenly, they realised that there was fresh water there and there were big, tall, straight gum trees. And what that meant was that they had a watering place to replenish their fresh water supplies. And they had trees which could provide timber for repairs to ships, could be masts or just could be sawing up planks to, you know, for ship repair. So over the next 30 years, quite a number of those European maritime explorers ended up here at Adventure Bay. And it was, it was a, on the map, you know, it was there, they knew that was there and that's where they would aim for um, from, again, from 1773 to the early, early 19th century. Yep, so it's got a long, long history. It has got a long history. Um, so Fluted Cape, you, if you go to Grass Point, you keep going up, the people want to keep going up the hill, and that takes you to Fluted Cape, which are probably 200 metre high cliffs, sheer dolerite cliffs, straight down into the sea. In this photograph, you're looking over Storm Bay towards Port Arthur in the point right in the, in the distance there. Um, spectacular walk, mm. like so many walks in Tasmania. And the other thing we are, you can see in Bruni on Bruni is quite unique because it has this population of albino wallabies, um, which are you know, extraordinary. And um, quite often we see those where we start the walk at Adventure Bay, going out towards Grass Point. Yeah, lovely. And um, for anybody who doesn't want to do those, those hikes or those walks, um, you know, we do have alternatives. We always have alternatives um, with our itineraries. So those who don't want to do any walks, um, our little explorer tender can take you right up to those um, soaring dollar eye cliffs at the Fluted Cape. Um, and you can really just admire um, how grand those are. Um, and then we also could uh, take a stop at the Bly Museum. That's right. So William Bly... Mutiny of, the Bounty, uh, Mutiny of the Bounty fame and also the Rum Rebellion was the only governor in, in Australia to have been kicked out after a rebellion, really, um, in, in 1808 in Sydney. He actually came to, to Adventure Bay several times in the er, earlier... In fact, on the Bounty, they came to Adventure Bay to rewater. And so back in the 1950s, um, a Hobart man bought this old building in, in Adventure Bay and set up this little museum, which he called the Bly Museum. And it's about Pacific exploration, really. It's only very small, but it's quite an interesting little museum. Yeah, good. A little bit something different for our guests to enjoy. That's right. Um, now, Mariah Island is um, definitely one on the, the bucket list for people to see. Um, I, have, I myself haven't been there yet, but, um, you know, lots of native Tasmanian species here, um, affectionately known as Noah's Ark. Plenty to do here, plenty to see. Indeed, and as we can see from these photographs, just there's so much wildlife on the island. What we haven't got a picture of are Tasmanian devils. So when yeah. we had the Tasmanian devil disease uh, started, what, 20 years ago, and they got some insurance populations in different places to which were animals without the disease 
Um, they've put them in various locations. And one of those locations was Marar Island. So there's actually quite a big devil population on the island as well. The Cape Barren goose down in the um, middle at the bottom there, they're very, very common around Darlington, which is a convict settlement that we go into on the Explorer. Uh, it's also World Heritage listed, Darlington. Um, wombats everywhere. <laughs> you yeah. just see so many wombats. There's almost too many wombats. Yeah. <laughs> almost trip over them sometimes <laughs> on, on, um, on Mariah Island. You can see in the top left there, that building there, that's, that's an 1825 building from the convict era. So there were, there were two convict settlements on Mariah Island in the 1820s and in the 1840s. And so there's quite a substantial uh, pres convict presence there. And that, that's actually why the island is uh, World Heritage listed for as part of a serial listing of convict sites around Australia, um, several sites in Tasmania, but Mariah Island is, is one of those. Incredibly, there was also heavy industry on Mariah Island. It just you can see with the, with the that barn there, the mm. brick barn, just to the right of that, you can just see that looks like something concrete um, sticking up. They're actually concrete silos. So back in the 1920s, they were they were uh, making cement on Mariah Island. They had 400 people living on uh, on the island. They had they had electricity there when towns on the Tasmanian mainland across the channel didn't have any electricity and people used to look across from the towns at Orford and Tribunna at the bright lights of Mariah Island. Now three or four people live there. So it's wow. really wow. quite extraordinary when you think about the changes in the history Absolutely. of that place. Absolutely. And of course, on the top right, there you've got the, the fossil cliff. So we do a few different walks on Mariah. We can do a little historic walk around the Darlington settlement. Uh, and we also walk to the painted cliffs, these cliffs here on the top right photograph, which are... Um, They're spectacular, aren't they? Cliff. It's like a piece of artwork. They are like a piece of artwork. That, that's all been caused from water seepage through, you know, from above down across the sandstone cliffs. And at low tide, you can walk out, you know, right along the cliffs there and really enjoy, enjoy that... Um, that, that beautiful scene. It's been one of, I think it's been a, a favourite place for Tasmanians for 100 years or more. Mm. <laughs> going to the, you going can to see the why, place. really. You can really see why. Yes, yes, indeed. Now, this is another popular walk um, on Mariah Island, is the Fossil Cliffs Walk. Yeah, so this is a, a slightly longer walk. It's not a hard walk, but it's a probably takes two or three hours to do this circuit. Um, and it takes you... Uh, well, up this hill here and then down the other side to the fossil cliffs, which were excavated back in the 1920s for the cement industry. So they're because, they're, and it's <clears throat> the Devonian sea fossils from the Devonian era, um, hundreds of millions of years ago. And David Attenborough has actually, on some, one of his programs, has nominated, nominated it as one of his, the most important fossil sites in the world, this Devonian um, yep, fantastic. So the cliffs were quarried for the limestone. So with fossils, you get limestone. So they were quarried for the quarried for the limestone for the cement making. But now we can walk down onto the cliffs to the base of the cliffs, and you're just looking at rocks, which is just completely covered in in these Devonian era fossils. Just, just fantastic. Yeah, wonderful. Great, uh, great for our guests to see that as well. Yeah, and, uh, and the, definitely, definitely quite unique. Yes. In the background there, there's for one of the other of uh, coral expeditions trips, you've got Bishop and Clark. So I think the coastal treks walk. Are we going to talk about that later, or are we going? Yeah, to... yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll cover that later as well. Okay. So that's yep. fine. We can jump into that one. Yep. We can jump into that a bit later. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but that's. Good, good to know that that's the Bishop and Clark. It's the Bishop and Clark up, up there, those craggy peaks up there yep. looking over the sea. Yeah, yep. wonderful. And, of course, um, you know, what's a, a trip to Tasmania without uh, visiting Wineglass Bay? Spectacular. Yes, indeed. Um, it's, it's, again, it's one of the favourite spots really for anyone coming to Tasmania. I think Wineglass Bay, the Wineglass Bay track has more visitors than, than any other walking track in Tasmania. Um, a lot of people just go as f who are coming by driving 
they don't actually get to, to Wyangas Bay. They come in the car park and they walk up to the lookout, which is yep. at the bottom left there. But of course, because we're coming in by sea and we actually come in on the inland side usually of, of um, the Freysnay Peninsula, which Wineglass Bay is on. So this photograph on the bottom left there is Wineglass Bay in front of you. We go on the inside to the right-hand side, you can't see of that. There's uh, Hazards Bay and Hazards Beach or Promise Bay and Hazards Beach. And we get dropped off there. And then we walk about 45 minutes across the Isthmus, this lovely walk, very flat walk through Tea Tree and Banksia with the big lagoon on the right-hand side across to Wine Glass Bay. So we don't have to do the thousand steps up and the thousand steps down, yeah. <laughs> which most visitors have to do to get to the bay. Now, people who want to go and have a look at the view from the lookout, then we do do a thousand steps. Those ones do do a thousand steps up. As long as they know that they've got to be prepared for all those steps. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But you can see from the view of that photograph what a spectacular oh, that's it. view that is. You and then the beach, so popular. Still, the beach itself on the right there is just gorgeous. You've got the hazards in the background, these granite, red granite peaks, um, which just rise straight, you know, six to 700 metres straight out of the, the water. Mm. Um, this crystal, crystal clear water. People look at it and think they're in Queensland if they... Jump in the water, they'll realise pretty quickly they're not in Queensland. No, I'm sure not. <laughs> a little bit cooler. A little bit cooler, indeed. <laughs> a little bit cooler. Yeah. But then, the, so what happens is the, the CD goes around the Freysnay Peninsula, it drops us off at Promise Bay, goes around the Freysnay Peninsula into Wineglass Bay, and then drops the explorer off to come and pick us all up on Wineglass Bay at the southern end of Wineglass Bay. Yeah, and that's it. You can see the Explorer tender. It's a much closer up um, view of the Explorer here, dropping our guests straight off on the beach. No, no clambering in and out and looking silly. Um, it really does, you know, and it's got the, the hydraulic lift that takes you straight back onto the, the deck as well. So um, no need for clambering around. It's a it's a great vessel to get us into those um, those remote spots. That's right, yes. Um, and of course, um, Scouting Island. Um, shooting island yes sorry, well you know actually I'll i think say, i'll say actually, that again you're actually probably got closer to the dutch pronunciation uh, probably yeah probably <laughs> yeah I, i'm i'm giving the tasmanian pronunciation we, well, did, we did have a couple of um dutch guys on one of my cruises a couple of years ago who kept trying to you know scout and scout and island. yeah 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 i think that's <laughs> uh, i think just because that's what i'm used to as south african um i've just shooting island lies off the southern tip of the freysnay peninsula and it's part of the national park as well um and it's very remote very few people get to shooting island there's been a little bit of farming there in the past in the summer, you get yachties who come and camp here. It's a favourite spot for yachties to come and camp for often for a week or two. There's an old farmhouse there that where a couple of um, there's some volunteers who look after the island basically during the, the camping areas yeah. in the summertime. Beautiful beach combing. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of marine biologists who work as guest lecturers or, or expedition crew on on the coral discoverer and. They're fantastic at t taking us through all the, the marine uh, history, yeah. the marine marine natural history of, of this this beautiful this beautiful beach. And I know you said it's freezing cold, but um, I know after a decent hike or walk, it's nice to just have a refreshing dip. So you know, bring everything from swimmers to woolies to, you know, uh, raincoats. I think you've got to be really well prepared for an array of activities and um, weather events in Tassie. Absolutely. <laughs> Especially when you go to the southwest. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, this is, this is always what I think of when I when I think of Tasmania, these um, these soaring, soaring geological formations. Um, they're incredible. So this is Cape Pillar um, off the south. Oh, actually, no, it's not. That's, that's it, yeah, that's Cape Pillar off the uh, south, southern tip of the Tasman Island, which is where Port Arthur is. Mm. Cape Pillar, this is also on a national park. Uh, it's um, got the highest sea cliffs in Australia. So again, it's dolerite, 
Tasmania is the only place in Tasmania that has this, these dolerite rock formations, and they're all over the all over the island. Our, our, most of our mountains are dolerite mountains, and these sea cliffs. These cliffs are from sea to the top, are three hundred meters high at Cape Pillar. Yeah, just um, powering. It, there's a, an amazing walk, the Three Capes Walk, which walks out to there. But we do it, that's about a four day walk. We do it the easy way. We do it <laughs> on the Coral Discoverer. And you, you were saying before about the, the shallow draft of the, the mm. Discoverer. What that means is so off, the, off, off Cape Pillar, there's an island called Tasman Island. And it's quite, a, it's, again, it's 300 meter cliffs all the way around. And there's a lighthouse on there that was built in the beginning of the 20th century. But the, the passage is quite narrow between Cape Pillar and um, Tasman Island. And it, you know, it's only, it's only about 10 to 15 meters deep. Mm. But the, the coral discoverer, it, with its draft, it can go through that passage. And to me, I think that's the highlight of the whole, the whole trip. Is actually it's going right through, through that passage. That passage, yeah. And not only are you going through the passage with these amazing cliffs on either side, you've got seals on um, Tasman Island and the rocks around the base of Tasman Island. You've got albatross flying around. We've often got dolphins swimming around. I think the last trip I did last year, we had a couple of penguins swimming past us. That's fantastic. There are little fairy prines, there are Australasian gannets diving from 100 metres high, straight vertically down in the water for fishing. There's mutton birds which have been flying from Alaska, fly down to Tasmania every year for breeding. It is just the most extraordinary place. And as I said, for me, that's the highlight. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. I, yeah. I just want to go to see that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. Um, of course, all good things must come to an end. Um, you know, this is Port Arthur is probably one of the most famous places in, in Tasmania. Yes, indeed. I mean, I'm sure everybody will have heard of Port Arthur. It's again one of the most touristed places, visited places in Tasmania. It was a convict settlement from about 1830 and it finally closed in 1876, 1877. Um, some people think that all the convicts that came to Tasmania went through Port Arthur. That's not the case. It was actually a place, it's called a place of secondary punishment. So convicts who came to Tasmania, who then committed some other crime in Tasmania, they would then be convicted and they would be sent to places like Port Arthur for further punishment. So it was a pretty grim place, <laughs> wasn't it? <a laughs> yeah. Place to be. Yeah. Which is amazing when you get there now because it's 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 beautiful. You know, scenically it's beautiful, um, and you think, oh, it must have been really nice being here. But you've got these very forbidding stone buildings. This was the church, yeah. uh, that we've got this photograph of, which was never consecrated as a church for any particular de denomination because we had Catholics and Anglicans and non-conformists in, in Port Arthur. And so they made it a church that anybody could go to. Um, apparently the, the, the Catholic prisoners kicked up a stink at first when they were told that it was only going to be for Church of England. Yeah, wow. So in the end they made it that it was for everyone. Um, unfortunately, there were big bushfires here in the 1890s and that's, that's when the roof of this yeah. disappeared. Um, we do a tour at Port Arthur that's given by one of the guides from the Port Arthur Management Authority, and they are invariably fantastic. The guides really know their stuff. They're fantastic storytellers. The tour usually takes about an hour. They take us to various points of the, of the settlement, and you really learn so much about the convict system, about Tasmania, about the history of Port Arthur. Yeah, fantastic. Um, well, it's um, definitely a very, very rich itinerary in, in, in every aspect. So um, uh, certainly one that um, our guests would, would love to, to learn more about and, um, and jump on as well. Yeah. Now, the other one, this is um, the other one that I was speaking about, the coastal treks of Tasmania. So while it follows a very similar itinerary that we've just covered, um, of course, there is there are those more um, strenuous and longer, more challenging hikes as well. So we do highly recommend that um, people have a good level of fitness when doing this. And if there are any mobility impairments that 
perhaps to consider another itinerary instead of this one, because it, it, there really are some wonderfully challenging hikes in this one. Um, and Ian, as you um, spent eight years um, as a remote bushwalking guide um, in the 80s and 90s in Tasmania, I'll um, let you um, run us through just very quickly what we're doing, um, you know, through all these hikes here. So um, back to Port Davy at Mount Beatty. So Mount, Be yep, Mount Beatty, this is... Um... This is getting closer to Melaleuca. It's uh, uh, not a particularly high mountain, but again, you can see the views you get from here. It's, um, it's a steep enough climb for part of it. Uh, it starts at a place called Clayton's Corner, and there's a little cottage there called Clayton's Hut, and it was built by Clyde and Wynne Clayton back in the 1960s. I should know this. I actually wrote a history of Clayton's Corner <laughs> in my years as a historian. Um, Clyde was a fisherman who'd been fishing in, in the West Coast, Southwest, for decades. Uh, they actually lived initially after he married Wynne, who is Denny King, the miner I spoke about previously. Yep. Wynne was Denny's sister. Uh, so Clyde married Wynne and they had a house much further out towards the edge of Port Davy, the western edge, a place called Bond Bay, which was great for fishing because it was closer to the fishing grounds, but it was su subject to terrible weather. <laughs> yeah, um, no surprise. 15 years there, they decided, no, we really need to get somewhere a bit more sheltered. So they built this house in at Clayton's Corner. <clears throat> and, and about 15 years ago, um, I helped to write a conservation plan for the, the, the building there. And it's been maintained by, by the Parks and Wildlife Service in partnership with yachties and fishermen since that time. So the place is restored. You go into the, the little house there and it's as if Wynne and Clyde have just walked out. Now that's wow. many years since both of them have died. Yeah. You know, there's their books in the, in the in, in shelves and their lounge chairs. And there's even in the, I'm always check it when I'm there, in the bathtub, there's a stick that sticks in the bathtub, leaning from the drain hole up to the <clears throat> to the outside of the you know, the top of the bath. Mm. And that was first put there. One of those was first put there by Clyde and Wynne when they went to, they went to Hobart to get supplies or take fish there or something or other. And they came back and they found a dead marsupial mouse in the bathtub. A, a mouse had come in had fallen into the bathtub and couldn't get out. So after that, whenever they left, they put a stick there so that if any animal fell in... It could get out. It could get out. Oh, that's a lovely story. And so that has been part of our conservation plan was that this should be maintained, and it has been maintained, and you still go there and you see a stick sitting there. So, that, um, so the walk starts right at there. You get off on a jetty, so it's a dry landing at, right at their cottage. You have a look at the cottage, then you walk up Mount Beatty here. Now, this is a place I was talking about before where, where we got the call one day. Was a, we were almost being blown over at the top here. This looks like a pretty good day here. And we got the call. We had to get back to the CD quickly because a, a storm was coming. And um, But, yeah, you just get the most <clears throat> magnificent views all around Bathurst, Bathurst Harbour, which yeah. is what we've got here. Melaleuca we led off to the right down there, going down to Melaleuca. Mm. Um, yeah, breath, breathtaking views. Breathtaking views. Yeah. Yes. And it certainly doesn't stop at that hike. No, it was the, <clears throat> the fluted Cape Walk, which we saw on the, the, um, the was it the Coastal Adventures trip? Um, coast, coastal uh, Wilds, yep. Yeah. Coast, coastal Wilds trip. Yeah, so this is on, on, um, on the fluted Cape Walk. A bit lower down on this walk is at a, between here and Grassy Point is... Um, is a lookout, and that's where the whalers used to come up, part of the way up Fluted Cape, to a spot like this where they could look out and see if there were any any whales out in the <clears throat> in the Tasman Sea out there, and sort of race down or send a message down to the whalers to go out in their boats. So this this is a lovely walk. It's a two to three hour long walk. Goes up through some beautiful coastal. Um, eucalypt forests where there are 40 spotted partilodes, which is another one of our very rare endemic birds in Tasmania. And, uh, Brown Adventure Bay is one of the few places where they are. Um, very hard to see. They're usually 40 metres up 
when a tiny bird's 40 metres up in a tree, but the good bird is they spot them. Yeah. Um, and then up to the cliffs and then down to Grass Point and back around the coast again. And you see here, again, the views over the Tasman Sea across Storm Bay towards Port Arthur and Tasman Island, just amazing. Yeah, beautiful. And then we've got on um, the Cape Hoy Walk. Yeah, so Cape Hoy is... Uh, is that which is spelled H? Yeah, so it's hard to know how to say that, but <laughs> um, it's part of the Three Capes track. It's the last cape that people do. So, but we can walk it as a day walk. It's about a four hour day trip, a day walk from Fortescue Bay. Cape Hoy is you're right out on the cape here, just about in the top left hand photo, and obviously the top right hand photo. Um, again, you've got these amazing sea cliffs. You've got these islands beyond it called the, the lanterns, these yeah. sloping islands. Um, I always used to think that Cape Hoy, when I first started going there in the 1980s, had the most spectacular, it was the most spectacular lunch spot in Tasmania. <laughs> you'd go out there and you'd just be at the, you know, right on these cliffs looking straight down. Oh, I couldn't it's agree with you more. I'd love to have a, a lunch break there. Yeah. It's a it's a very strenuous walk. Yeah. It's um it's not flat. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of up and down. Yeah. There's a lot of steps, a lot of steps, and they, they can be quite strenuous to go up and down. Actually, in the photograph on the top left there, you can see the people on the lookout. You can. And just beyond that, there's on the right to the right of them, you can't really tell what it is, but that's actually a single sea stack. It's called the Candlestick, and it's, it, it's an island in itself. It's probably... Wow. 10 metres yeah. wide by 20 metres long, something like that. And it's actually a, a, a very well-known rock climbing destination in Tasmania. So you can only get there really by boat and it's only in good weather. And occasionally, if you're very lucky, you'll see some people rock climbing on the candlestick when you go out to Cape Hoy. I'll certainly leave that to somebody else. Um, I don't think <laughs> rock climbing would be my thing. Happy to do the hikes and the walks, but uh, not the rock climbing as beautiful as it is. Yeah, so I think you and me both there. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, no, this Bishop is um, Bishop and Clark is really, um, there's nothing much like it in Australia, is there? No, I think Bishop and Clark could actually be vying with Cape Hoy for the best mm. lunch spot in Tasmania. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now this is a this is actually a, a, probably the most strenuous walk in the coastal tracks I reckon. It's about a five hour return walk from Darlington on Marara Island. Um, there's some very steep tracks, and then you climb up through these scree slopes, and then finally up the final boulder field, and then just before the top, you've actually got a little vertical section which which you need to be a bit careful of, but people there to help you if you're not used to that sort of thing. It's not, not hard, it's just you know, have to be a bit careful. Um, and at the top, you get to the top and you've got to be careful when you get to the top, you don't sort of run across too far because then you're looking at 600 metre drop down to the, oh, pretty much down to the water. That's, uh, um, that's quite high. <laughs> yes, it is, yeah. it, it's extraordinary. And then you, you're also looking north across Oyster Bay up to Freysand National Park, Shooton Island or Southern Island <laughs> and Freysand National Park yeah. up towards Wineglass Bay. Um, it, is, it is really very, very spectacular place yeah. to be. Yeah, so definitely one of the more challenging ones and just uh, reiterating that, that your fitness levels definitely have to be pretty good to tackle this one. I think you can see that photo on the left. Uh, yeah, that will give people a good idea of, of, you know, this is very close to the top there. Yeah, um, smiles on faces, but need a break. Need a break, but also <laughs> you can see that it is, it's, it's not, it's not a, a, an easy track. No, you know, that's it. You need to be, you need to be confidently mobile and, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. If you've got mobility issues, you wouldn't want to be there. No, definitely not. Yeah. And um, and uh, we've we've have covered this uh, briefly. The um, Ismith, Ismith track. Yes, the thousand steps. That's it. <laughs> the thousand steps to, to, from from Wineglass Bay up. Yeah. Um, but but hey. And that does know, do the loop. Why wouldn't you with that view? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Why yeah. wouldn't you? No, that's um, lovely. 
Yes. Um, Ian, thank you very much for diving into um, that itinerary with us for both of those. Um, it's been really valuable to, to have you join us today. Um, so we do also do the circumnavigation of Tasmania. Uh, 2023 is sold out, um, but we can start looking at 2024 um, and just doing the whole, the whole of Tasmania. Oh, and that is fantastic. Yep. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, we've also got the Yachtsman's Cruise. Um, we've only got a handful of spots left on that one for this year. So if you wanted to spend New Year's on board, um, definitely jump in and, um, and join us for that one. Um, so really easy. We've made it really easy on the website now to make a booking. Um, so just jump into your um, destinations, find the destination you're looking for, and um, the big red button that says make a booking. Um, five easy steps and um, you're booked in with us. So otherwise you can give our reservations team a call as well and they'll give you a hand with that one. So Ian, thank you um, very much for joining us today. Um, it was really a pleasure to have you um, and your expertise um, as a guest lecturer and um, hopefully we will see you on board soon again. Thanks Diana, I'm looking forward to it already. <laughs> yeah, wonderful, me too. <laughs> Thanks Ian, take care. Bye.